So why don't we, as customary, start with prayer. Okay, Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to assemble together as believers in Christ. And we have this time now to devote to thee, to learn more about you and your word. And so we pray, Lord, that as we engage with Bible doctrine, that you would help us to understand these things clearly so that we can make adjustments in our lives when necessary, so that we can make application to these truths. Perchance if we've committed any sins prior to opening our computers or our cell phones, we'll just take this opportunity right now to exercise 1 John 1, 9, which says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we'll just take a moment of silence and pray, and then I'll open with prayer. Thank you, Father, for this opportunity to examine your word tonight. And I pray now that as we look into your word, that you would help us to focus amidst all the things that may be concerning us at the moment. We ask and pray these things through Christ's matchless name in which we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, let's start with the verse in front of us, a very popular verse, and I know... In the past, I may have talked about this, but let's look at it again. Philippians 4.13. It's a very popular verse, and we may have used it ourselves, but I want us to know what it says in its proper context. We don't want to mishandle the word, and so I want us to see firsthand what it's really talking about, because if you watch sports, if you watch boxing or any kind of sports You'll sometimes see the athletes wear Philippians 4.13 on their gear, which says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And so they use this as kind of like a, a magic formula to win. You know, because of this, I'm going to win because through Christ, I can do all things. I can do anything through Christ. And many Christians say that too. You know, when they're going through hardship, well, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So it's a good verse to know, but it's better to know what it means in its context. Because like I said last night, if you were there, words alone are meaningless. There has to be a context around it to help us shape the understanding of what that verse or what the word means itself. And so we don't want to use it loosely because it may not even mean what we think it means. And so, as I've said before, we don't want to put words in God's mouth. We don't want it to say something that God didn't intend to say. And so, it is a, it's critical for us to know exactly what the text is saying. So, let's look at the verse in front of us. Notice what it says here. I can do all th things through Christ who strengthens me. So, it's pretty clear that Paul speaking is saying, I can do all things through Christ, but... Again, in our minds, we should say, okay, what does that mean? Does that mean that I can jump like a grasshopper because I can do all things through Christ? I can jump like a grasshopper. I can scale the side of a building. What does it actually mean? I can do all things through Christ. And so we know that it, it has something to do with being in Christ through the power of Christ because it's him who strengthens me, right? Right? So that part we can see right in the one verse, in verse 13. So I can do all things through Christ, who in turn strengthens me. So, so far so good. But we need to back up just a little bit because the context is always the verses that precede it and follow it. And so there's not much after 13. So in this case here, it's important to see what's before it, especially in the immediate context. The immediate context always refers to several verses before before the author says what he says in this case here I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me so now I'm going to back it up a little bit this is the New King James Version uh, in verse 11 and 12 it says the following not that I speak in regard to need for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content I know how to be abased and I know how to abound 
everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. So another working translation says it like this. So that's the New King James, Philippians 4, 11, and 12. If we look at the NLT, the New Living Translation, again, it's a little easier to understand it, but it's not a good study translation, but it serves our purpose. It helps us understand what the text is saying. So listen to, now, listen to it as I read it now. Paul is saying, beginning with verse 11, not that I was ever in need, for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. So now he's talking about being content in whatever he has in his possession, whatever he owns, whatever is available to him. I have learned. So he's acquired this ability to be content in whatever I have. What little, what, what, if I have plenty, I'm content. If I have little, I'm okay too. I know how to live, verse 12, on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned the secret in living situation, in every living, in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or with an empty one, with plenty or little. Then verse 13, for I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So that strength, that ability to do everything through Christ is something that flows from 11 and 12. And in 11 and 12, what we gather and what we get is that he has learned, verse 11, he's learned how to be content. And in verse 12, I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything, with a lot of stuff. I've learned the secret, verse 12, of living in every situation. We could use the word circumstance. Whether it is, it is with a full stomach or an empty stomach, with plenty or little. For I can do all things or everything through Christ who gives me strength. So now what is it talking about? You see how the context shapes the meaning? He's not saying I can jump like a grasshopper or I can run like a cheetah. He's saying I can do all things. What is the all things? I know how to be content. I've learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live with almost nothing, and I know how to live with everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation. So some of you may be going through some hardship or trials or circumstances that nobody is even aware of, and so it's very private and personal. But as you get into his word, this, the teaching of God's word, Bible doctrine consistently, you start to realize that this is what Paul had this is what I can have too. So even though I don't have a lot, I can be content. Isn't that true? You've, you've met people who it seems like nothing phases them, whether they're a believer or unbeliever. Now, if they're an unbeliever, more so we should be content because we have God the Holy Spirit. We have God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit who e equips us, enables us to live in such a way that would bring honor and glory to God. We have the stuff that allows us to be stable, in other words. We can be content regardless of what's going on in our life because of God. We have Him. And that's what you get in the conclusion of Paul's dissertation here. He says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. He gives me the strength to learn that regardless of my circumstances, regardless of what I go through, I'm going to be okay. I've learned to live on almost nothing. I've also had a point in my life where I've had everything. I've learned the secret of living in every situation. How did he learn the secret? Because he's paired up with Christ. His focus is on him. The eye of faith is focused on him. We don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. So I'm showing you that the verses, as we make these observations, these mini studies before our book study, our topical study, or our doctrinal study, that when you observe the word itself, which is alive and powerful, that's what gives us stability, that's what improves our spiritual life, that's what gives us the eye of faith, 
that's what fortifies us. That's what gives us hope and confidence. So that regardless of what's going on, on around us, we can stand firm on Him, the rock, the true rock. He's our source of stability and our strength. I mean, look at what Paul says here. He gives us a very popular verse 2,000 years prior. And he says, I can do everything in Christ. I can do all things through Christ, the New King James Version. This is just the NLT. But just the same, we know now that the reason why Paul can say, I can do all things through Christ, is because he's married to Christ, or he at least has this ongoing fellowship. And that's what I've been championing, and that's what I've been endorsing, and I'm trying to get everybody to see that regardless of where you are in life, whether you have little or you have plenty, you can still have stability and peace that overrides your circumstances, that overrides the challenges that you have, that overrides what little you have or continues to bless you in spite of what you have. Because ultimately, life is all about what happens when you pass from this life to the next. Because that's where the rubber meets the road. Because you and I one day are going to realize that all of this is temporal. So whether it's good stuff or bad stuff, it's temporal. It's temporal, meaning it's not for all eternity. There's only one thing that's going to go on for all eternity. And that's your soul. That's your spirit. That's the real you that is going to go on and on and on when you finally take your last breath. When that will take place, nobody knows. So while we still have breath, while we still can, we ought to store up the rewards for eternity because God talks about rewards. Gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, and stubble. So there is going to be an evaluation for all of us. So although... We're never going to be judged for our sins because that was judged on the cross 2,000 years ago. We will be judged for our efforts, our works, what we do here and now. He will evaluate us, our, our standing in Him when we meet Him in the future. So He will see our works. He will evaluate our works. What have we done for Christ? So there is a judgment in that sense where it will be evaluated and we will have to answer to him for what we do or what we do not do. So now, I also want to show you the context to what, why Paul and how Paul said this. So for that, I'm going to zoom out of the immediate context and look at Philippians 1. I want you to see something here. Because if we marry it to Philippians 4, I can do all things through Christ. I want you to see what he says here. Very, very important and eye-opening. And I want you to see that your life can make a difference. Look at Philippians, 4, uh, Philippians 1. Rudy, do you, can you read this for us? Philippians 1, 12 and 13. <clears throat> can you just unmute your mic and read it? Philippians... <clears throat> Philippians 10? Yes, Philippians 1, 12 to 13, please. 12 to 13. Uh, but I want you to know, Reverend, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. 13. So that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest. Very good. So I don't know if you saw that, guys, but Paul is in jail at this point. And when you get to chapter 4, you got two chapter 2, chapter 3, he's writing this letter from jail. Please notice what he says in verse 12 and 13. Remember I talked about the importance of context so that we get the full impact of of why what he says is meaningful and has weight and impact. Look at what he says here. I want you to know, brethren, another way of saying that is church. I want you to know, church, that the things which happened to me, getting thrown in jail, actually turned out for the furtherance of what? The gospel. 
So sometimes things happen, good, bad, or indifferent, for the furtherance of the gospel. Sometimes God takes you on a different path so that the gospel will be furthered. Do you see that there in verse 12? It actually, the things that happened to me actually turned out for the furtherance or the advancement of the gospel. Some of you may have, maybe your job recently let you go and now you're in another job or something along the, something similar. Or maybe that happened to you in the past and you're like, what in the world happened to me? I was happy in this company. I was getting paid well. I was doing well. Why in the world did God close the door there and move me here and change me to a different company? Well, Paul, at least in this context, I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me, and what happened? Look at verse 13. So it became evident that the whole palace guard, he's in jail, and to all the rest who were there, that my chains are not in jail, but I'm chained to Christ. It became apparent to everyone. They knew based on my lifestyle. They knew based on my commitment to Jesus Christ. And if you were there last night to study who are you, we found out and we learned that the fifth gospel is your life. The ability to see your life is sometimes much more important than reading the text of scripture, telling them what the Greek word says, the Hebrew word says. Sometimes that doesn't matter. To the person, there's, a per, there's people who generally just want to know, hey, am I important? What good is it to tell them what the text says, even in its context, if it doesn't mean anything to them? So sometimes your life is the fifth gospel, as the author said last night, to, that impacts the people around you. Now here's a perfect example of that passage if you were there with me last night. Paul, in jail, says the following. I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me, and that's why I jumped down to 13, where was he? He was in the palace guard. He was in jail. He was in the penitentiary. And he was chained to the guard. But, G- but Paul says here, but everyone knew that I was really chained in Christ, to Christ. Notice in the tail end of verse 13. To all the rest that my chains are in Christ. In other words, another way of saying that is, look, everybody knew, knew I, was in cha- I was chained up, I was in jail. But visually speaking, they could see that even though I'm in jail, I was not really there. You know that sometimes people can be there physically, but they're not really there. Their, their mind and their body might be there, but they're somewhere else because their, their mind is wandering. And Paul says it here too, that although I was in jail, everybody there knew that my chains and my commitment was to the Lord Jesus Christ. They all knew that. And that is eye-opening. That is something that we need to see that sometimes verse 12 will happen in your life Maybe he'll shift your job a little to the left, a little to the right, or he'll move you to a completely different department. And you'll have to work for someone else. And you'll have to work over here. You'll need to go over there. You'll go downstairs, upstairs to a different department. Uh, Mr. Cortez, we need you on in HR today. We don't need you here in assembly line. You're going you're gonna to go help out in HR. What? I have no experience in that. Don't worry, we'll train you. What? I don't want to be there. Paul says, look, the things that happened to me actually had a a benefit for the furtherance of the gospel. So that is why I, I, I highlight this because looking at things through the eye of faith, when things happen in your life, there is always a reason. There's always the physical realm, but there's also the spiritual realm that we must consider. God is always working and orchestrating His will behind the scenes you may not see it but you can look with the eye of faith and say you know what I don't agree with what's going on now but I'm gonna have to step out in faith and trust that God knows what he's doing I don't like this at all 
But I, if God is, if God is perfect and He does things perfectly, do you believe that? If God is perfect and He does things perfectly, then this will work. This will work perfectly. I mean, that's the conclusion, right? So, if you, in your heart's heart, believe that God is perfect and He does things perfectly then whatever delay, whatever is going on in your current situation, that's part of God's perfect plan for you and for me. And so like Paul, now he's looking at this and saying, look, this actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel. You know what? These guys, they they chained me up, but guess what? They know that my chains, verse 13, is in Christ. It's to Christ. They know that I was chained up, but they could tell that I was zoned out because even though my, my hands were chained to the guards, they knew I wasn't there. They knew my heart was focused up there in the heavenlies. They knew that even though I was physically there, I was in the heavenly realms because that's where my destination is anyways. And by the way, by the time he gets to chapter 4, what does he say? I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I know how to be content whether I have a little or a lot and by the way I'm in jail right now you guys know that but anyways not only has it not only is this for the furtherance of the gospel but everybody here in jail is no that is fully aware of this that I'm chained to Jesus Christ and by the way I want you to know I can I can do all things through Christ Jesus and so can you you know what's really fascinating about this Paul was writing this to encourage the church. He's the one who needed encouragement. He's in jail. They should have been visiting him in jail. But instead, he's writing letters to the church and saying, it's going to be okay. There's a purpose for why this happened. There's a, a furtherance of the gospel. I'm chained to Christ anyways. They can't get, they can't get me. I'm in Christ. And then by the time you get to two, three chapters over to chapter 4, he says, hey, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So he's not talking about hopping like a, like a grasshopper. He's saying, look, they think they got me. They think they got me chained here in the, in, in the jail, jail cell. Not even. I'm free. I'm free as a dove. I'm free as a bird. Why? Because I'm chained to Christ. That's looking at circumstances through the eye of faith. That is why it is so critical and so important to get with Bible doctrine and to see and to correlate and to synthesize the various passages, the various verses together so that in life, practically speaking, you're going to be able to apply this and you're going to remain stable because you're going to know that there is a purpose behind everything that God does. Now, are you going to always like it? Of course not. You think Paul liked it when he was in jail? Not even. But is he able to, to understand that God is doing something? Yes, that's why he wrote 13 books of the New Testament. To encourage you and me. So that when you get under a good Bible class, a good pastor teacher, you're going to be able to say, Okay, I get it now. I see it now. I see why there's repetition. I see why there's this ongoing fortification of the same doctrines because the truth is that's what we need in in the current times that we're living in you're not getting that from cbn or nbc or anything like that you're only going to get it through god's word how many times are you going to be able to say i can do all things through christ who strengthens me and know what that actually means and to know it in its context you've got these athletes who are wearing it on their gear and using it for the wrong reason reason out of context God is not going to help them win a football game just because they wear it in their jersey is that advancing the gospel no that's using that as a magic formula that hey I can do all things I'm going to plow through and you're going on the ground because God is backing me up and I'm going to beat you to the ground because of I can do all things through Christ I don't think that's exactly how God intended for it to be understood. Why? Because we read the context. Remember, I can do all things with plenty or a little. That's the context as to why Paul wrote that. That's what I mean about not mishandling the Word of God. It may sound cutesy. It may sound very popular. 
You know, I can do all things through Christ, but if you mishandle God's word, what's going to happen to the person who hears that and it's not happening to them? Now you've devastated their faith in God because they thought they can do all things through Christ because you told them that's what the Bible says. And now their faith is devastated and ruined. And now they say, I don't want Christianity anymore. It doesn't work. So that is why a lot of people have walked away from the faith because they're getting trained in a place where it's not even teaching solid doctrine. And I, I'm very strong on that because that's the key to learning and unlocking what the verses mean. So it's kind of like if you're going to go to a doctor, you want someone who has been thoroughly trained so that they can operate and do procedures in your, in your, on your heart, on your person, on your body, on your loved one. You don't want someone who just studied a book or went through a pamphlet or took an online course. You want someone who's been there, has the experience, has been mentored. And I repeatedly say this because I'm trying to get all of you to see that it is so critical in the times that we're living in now to get grounded with solid Bible doctrine. There is no other way. We're living in a time where we're close to the rapture of the church and we need to lock shields now and advance the cause of Christ. We have to do the furtherance of the gospel based on what we know to be true from the word of God and set it on fire and, and give the devil a, a hard time. We got to run hard for Christ. So that's what I have been doing. That's been my goal and objective. I want all people, as I meet them, to advance the cause of Christ. Because, not because I'm saying so, but because my Lord says so. We, our Lord says so. So if that's true, if he says, my desire is that none should perish, do we wink at that and say, well, that's your, that's your thing, Lord. He's counting on you and me. He wants us to be salt and light in this world. And thus we must. It's not optional. It's not optional. So that's the opening verse that I wanted to start us off with so that you can see how exhilarating it is what happens when you see a very popular verse that's mishandled today, understood properly. Not only does it start to open our eyes and make better sense, but now you can understand that if I'm going to use that verse or if you're going to use that verse, now you're not going to hop around as a grasshopper hops, but now you can say, look, even though I don't have a lot right now, God can teach me how to be content amidst all this because he's going to work this out anyways. So maybe you have a little right now, but I think God is going to slowly work this out as I exercise the eye of faith, trusting in him, faith resting in him, taking all the other doctrines and synthesizing it and saying, okay, did you not say that you'll cause all things to work together for good to those who love you? So when you merge the two together, you have little, God will cause all things to work together for good. Hey, sky's the limit. He's going to bless you out of your socks because of his grace. You're his son. You're his daughter. He says the birds are taken care of. The lilies are taken care of. Are you not more important than they? So now when you pull them all together, your soul should be resting. Your soul should be encouraged. There should be a real sense of stability and confidence in our Lord. Because he wants that and desires that. And that's, it's to our advantage as we get into his word, as we study doctrines like what we're looking at now, the Christian at ease, and merging it with his word, you got a double dose of his word his doctrine as we're unpacking it together. So that's why it's always a beautiful thing when we congregate together like this, digitally speaking, and look at his word to see what all this means. So I'm going to move on now to the text. And if you want to ask anything about Philippians 4.13 or Philippians 1.11-13, we can save that for the end. But let me advance now to the book because I actually was planning to go through the book here. So now, let me see. Oh, why is this okay? This is page nine. Okay. We started, we ended on 10 last week, so I'm just going to take off from right there in the middle 
so that it'll make sense when we get to where we left off on page 10 last week. So ver uh, page 9, he says, let the Lord do it. What Do what? Well, watch this. Cast your care upon him. Why? Because he cares for you. 1 Peter 5, 7. That is a verse you should highlight in your Bible, underline, or note in a pad of paper. You should write this down. Because how many of you have anxiety? How many of you have... Um, you're anxious. You're worried. Cast your worries upon him because he cares for you. We need to know that he cares for us. He loves us and he will take care of you. He has supreme sovereign power to do what no one else can do. Okay? And what does he say? Cast your worries, cast your anxiety upon him because he cares for you. So that is a very important verse. And that's something we should always look at. Cast your cares upon him because he loves you. And then it's met, uh, merged with Psalms 37, 4 to 5. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him and he will what? He will do it. So notice what he says here. If you... Delight yourself in the Lord. Focus on Him. Focus, uh, occupy yourself with Him. He will give you your desires because as you're occupying yourself with Him and Bible doctrine, He ultimately is going to give you the desires of your heart, not His heart. His desire is to give you what you want. <laughs> Psalms 37. He wants you to put Him first and then He's going to give you what you want. I mean, it's amazing. You put Him first you occupy, occupy yourself with Christ, delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give you the, the, the desires of your heart. And He says, commit your way to the Lord. Whatever it is that you're doing, put Him first. If you're going to pursue education, you're going to pursue employment, you're going to pursue property or anything, commit yourself to your, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in Him. As you commit that to him, whatever endeavor it is, trust also in him because he can take care of it. So you may commit your way. Say, Lord, I, I'm going to pray now. I'm going to. I want this uh, house. I want to buy this property. So I'm. I'm going to commit this to you, Lord. But he wants you to trust also in him. You can pray all you want, but if you're not going to trust also, you see that there in Psalms 37. Trust also. So it's just. It's not just to commit your way to the Lord. But trust also in Him. So commit and trust your way to Him. And He will what? He will do it. So if you commit your way to the Lord. So if you're about to pursue something. Listen to this. Watch this. I don't know if you saw this. If you're going to commit your plan to God. Trust also in that plan with God. Guess what? He will do what? He will do it. Do what? Your plan. Right there in Psalms 37, 5. Four and five. So occupy yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. In other words, put, your, put him first and he'll give you what you want. I mean, that's a win-win situation, right? God wants you to put him first and he's going to give you the desires of your heart. Because he's going to influence you in such a way that is Christ-like. He's conforming you to the likeness of Christ. But then he goes on to say, just to be clear, you put him first, he's going to give you the desires of your heart. Now, commit your ways. Whatever it is that was deviating and causing you to go sideways and put him second and put uh, your endeavor first. He says, look, commit your way to me. Trust also in me and I will do it. Did you see that? That's all wrapped up in Psalms 37. Delight yourself, occupy yourself in the Lord. He will give you the desires of your heart. Why did he say that? Because of the second half of the verse here. Commit your way to the Lord. That way to the Lord. Commit your way to the Lord. Commit whatever it is that you're pursuing. Then he'll give you the, that. He will give you the desires of your heart. You're being pulled left and right. God says me first. He says occupy yourself in me first. Delight yourself in the Lord first. And then he will give you the desires of your heart. That's why there's a tug of war. You got God second and yourself first. And he says, look, 
How about this? If you put me first, I'll give you what you want. I'll give you the desires of your heart. So then he says, this is the plan, okay? I'll give you the desires of your heart, but commit your desires, commit your way to me. And trust also. Don't just say, I'm giving it to you, Lord. You may cast your cares upon me, your worries upon me, but if, you, if you're going to exercise Psalms 37, make sure you commit your way to the Lord, but you have to trust that I'm going to follow it through. And he will what? He will do it. There's a lot to unpack there. That's why you don't want to study a word without concentrating word for word for word contextually and digging deep and having and sitting under someone who can help you unpack it slowly and see it for what it's saying. Okay? So there's a lot here. The Hebrew word for delight in Psalms 37, 4, 5 means to be occupied with and that's what I've been using because I know that's what it means occupied with the Lord delight yourself in the Lord occupy yourself with Christ when you love someone very much you think about that person constantly you are commanded to be occupied with the Lord in the same way blessings accrue from concentration on Jesus Christ so if you concentrate on Christ, he'll give you the desires of your heart. But if you concentrate on yourself and your own plans, you're divided now. God is second, third, fourth, fifth. And when he sits on the last of the list of priorities, you're not going to get anything. You're only going to get stress. Your health is going to suffer because you're worried about, am I going to get it? Am I not? Am the deal going to open or close? And so you're stressed out. And the worries of the world, the worries of the, the things today, is not what God wants you to go through. Which is why he wants you to involve him. And if you involve him, if you occupy yourself with Christ, he'll, he'll give you the desires of your heart. But you have to trust him, you have to commit your way to him. And it says in verse 5, he will do it himself. You want to do it, or do you want him to do it? You want someone who's perfect to execute it for you? Or do you, who's imperfect, want to try to do it yourself? That's your call. If you, for me, I would want someone who's perfect, who knows all things beginning from end, to do it for me. Because I'm, I make mistakes all the time. But if I let him handle it, then I don't have to fight. I don't have to worry. Vengeance is mine. God will cause all things to work together for good. Because he's sovereign. I'm not. So if he says he'll do it for me, I'd rather him do it. Wouldn't you? So now he goes on to say, the author, you're commanded to be occupied with the Lord. Blessings accrue from concentration on Jesus Christ. The word trust in this passage is literally keep on trusting, keep trusting. But how do you keep trusting in him under pressure? Good question. You tell the father, I'm in a wretched situation, top of page 10 now. I'm in a real jam. I know the principle of 1 Peter 5, 7. So here it is. Lord, I'm committing my problem to you. I'm trusting you. This is your problem. Father, you take it. You work it out. The battle is yours. That's R.B. Thames' words from Christian at ease. That's, how he, that's his example of a prayer when you're in a real jam, a real tough situation. He says, I know the principle of 1 Peter 5, 7. Lord... I know the principle. You, we, we just studied it tonight. I know all that now. I'm trusting in you. I'm committing my problem to you. I'm trusting you. This is now your problem. It's no longer my problem. This is your problem, Father. You take it. You work it out. The battle is yours. Isn't that a nice prayer? It almost sounds like you're commanding God, but it's not. It's just a, a, a more of a confident approach before the throne of grace. You now, you know, rather than panicking, you're saying, Lord, this is your problem. I can't do it. I realize now after what you've said in your word that I really don't have to worry about this. I can commit my way to you, trust you, and you'll do it. Is that not true, Lord? So if that's the case, I'm backing off. I'm not going to take it. I'm not going to call people. I'm not going to try to negotiate. I'm not going to try to do this and that and the other. I'm just going to leave it in your hands. I'm going to get on my knees and pray and thank you that I have the promises as found in your word. 
you're not going to get this kind of solution anywhere else. And the moment you put a phone call out and say, can you help me with this? You now negated the promises of God. Please know that, okay? So some, some Christians will start off praying and say, I'm casting my care upon you, but then they get on the phone and now they negate all the things that they were just doing because you're really not trusting. You did not commit the problem to him. So you either give it to him 100% and don't make the phone call, don't call someone, don't visit someone, don't take that pill, call, him, call upon him through prayer and give it to him completely and let him flood you with the peace that surpasses all understanding. But having said that, I want you to know that, that this is not an antidote to fix your problem that is pressing right now, but it is saying that when you are in a lifestyle situation, when you are a believer in Christ who's trying to make it through the, through the day, through the week, through the month, through the year, this has, been, has to be your go-to protocol. Standard operating procedure. Eye of faith. Don't, we don't walk by sight. We walk by faith. And so this is what it looks like. This is how we pray. Father, you, I'm going through hell right now. I need your help. Okay, Lord, you said this in 1 Peter 5, 7. The battle is yours. I can cast my care upon you. I'm stressing out. And I know you said be anxious for nothing. So I'm pulling another verse. I'm admitting to him. I'm actually confessing as I'm saying, you know, Lord, I am anxious right now. But you said be anxious for nothing and so I'm latching on to you I'm linking Philippians 4 6 and 7 and 1st Peter 5 Lord I'm going through hardship right now nobody knows about this I don't want to tell anybody I'm embarrassed about it but I know that you see me I know that you know all things you your word is the one that gives me comfort because I realize that I have someone that I can turn to and you're as close as where I'm at because you indwell me Whereas people that I know, I have to make a phone call or I have to drive to their place and talk to them and buy them a cup of coffee or buy them a meal and say, by the way, this is what's happening. Can you help me out? Whereas God is just a prayer away. He's inside us. We just have to, in our thoughts, create a prayer. Father, I'm going through hardship right now. I need your help. He said, cast my cares upon you. Father, I'm dumping this care upon you. I'm just, I'm unloading it on you because I, I am so far down the path, I don't even know how to deal with this anymore. That's what he loves. He loves the impossible stuff because that gives him the opportunity to prove to you, me, her, and them that with God, all things are possible. Sometimes we fall short of watching the hand of God move because at the last second, we retract and we say, okay, you start stressing out and therefore you negate everything again. When you negate everything, it's because now you're stressing out. So if you're saying you're going to cast your care upon him and you do initially, you pray to him, Father, you know I know you cause all things to work together for good to those who love you. And I have been living a life of obedience and I have been, uh, I can see that I'm in compliance with your word. So I'm thankful. I'm trying not to be anxious. Philippians 4 I'm giving thanks at the same time so I'll have a peace that surpasses all understanding. And then at the last second, a fleeting thought comes. But yeah, what about? Oh, shoot. Oh, my gosh. That's right. At the last second, you panic. You, you stress out. Guess what? You negated everything that you prayed to God about. That's where a lot of Christians fail. They start off going. They, they quote the right scripture. They do the right thing. They go to church, they go to Bible class, they get all the right things going, they confess their sins, but then at the last second, after they recall all these promises, they start off good, but at the last second, they, it's kind of like riding a, a roller coaster ride. I don't know if you've ever done this before. You go into a roller coaster ride and you say, oh, you're going on the ride, you see how fast the thing is going, and then you're, you're at the last minute, you're thinking like, I don't know if I can. You're looking at that exit sign those who don't want to go can exit here. And so you, you decide at the last second, I'm going, I can't do this. So that's the same way with the Christian life. Sometimes we say the right things, we pray the right things, and at the last second, we, we fail in the sense that we panic. And when we panic, we negate all the things we've just told God. You told God, I'm going to trust you, but then you stress out, and then you basically slap God in the face, and you said, I know I said I trust you, but... 
this is big. I, I started to take my eyes off of you and I started looking at the circumstances. So, sorry. So please know that you might be able to quote these verses. You might be able to faith rest for a second or two. But the moment you show everything against what you've just been studying, you negate it all. In other words, you un, unpack, you, you dissolve it all. It doesn't apply to you anymore. You have to start from beginning. You have to get back where you... I, so let's say that was you. What does that look like? What am I supposed to do then? Well, you confess that. Lord, I, I panic. I realize I started sweating. I was perspiring and I started to pick up my phone and text someone. Can you help me out? Can you loan me this money? And I realize that I'm trying to solve it on my own again. When in fact, I just got done casting my cares upon you and I, you knew all along that I was going to fail. And so, Lord, I confess this. Uh, I feel like a loser now. I, I just got done telling I'm casting my care upon you. And now I started to text my friend, can you loan me this money? So I'm really not trusting you. So that's how I would do it. If you, if you failed as you're casting your care, uh, go and confess your sin. Start all over. Lord, let's start again. Not that you have to start again. I need to uh, backtrack and start again. Father, I'm casting my care upon you. It is a big problem, and I, I know initially I started texting my friend. I'm not going to text my friend. I turn my phone off. I put it in the other room. It's just me and you. I'm going to trust you. I'm not going to worry about it anymore. I'm going to cook dinner, and get, get ready for the night, go to sleep, start my day off tomorrow. I'm going to trust that you're going to work things out in your time. But in the meantime, I need that peace that surpasses all understanding so that I won't have to worry. Did you not promise that to me? Did you not say the birds and the lilies are taken care of? Would you infuse me with peace like I've never experienced before? In Jesus' name, I ask. That's an example of how PF would do it. Okay? You have RB theme saying, I'm committing my problem to you. I'm trusting you. This is your problem. Father, you take it. You work it out. Battle's yours. So now I gave you PF's example of what I would say if I started to fail and I... I started to panic and text someone. I would confess that and then shift gears and go back into this similar prayer. Lord, I'm going to start all over. Battle's yours. Please take it over. I'm casting my cares upon you, etc., etc. So having said that, now the middle of... T uh, the top of 10. The battle is the Lord's. 1 Samuel 17, 47. This principle came from the lip, lips of David as he stood before Goliath. Remember, when you as a believer in Jesus Christ face overwhelming odds, and you will, when you suffer anxiety, and you will, cast your cares on God. This is no longer your fight. The Lord wants you to watch him fight. So this is what a good detailed study does. Very intricate, very clear it's his fight. It's not your fight. Not the Lord loves me. This I know for the Bible tells me. So no, we get into the nitty gritty. He reminds us that when David stood there opposing opposite of Goliath, he said, this is God's fight. You may try to solve your own problem and say, I just thought of something, Lord. Give me back the problems. So you apply your own human solution and everything falls apart. Kind of like what I said before, you, you start texting your friend, can you help me out financially? You just reverse course, Lord give me back that problem. You become even more miserable and finally resolve to become, or resolve to hand your problem back to God. Father, now I remember that only 1 Peter 5, 7 will help me. Now I'm ready to claim it. I'm casting my cares on you my anxieties, all my problems, and all my worries. Here, Father, take them all. Take them all, please. Then you relax, and for a few minutes you have inner peace. But suddenly you think of another solution. Oh, Lord, give it back. <laughs> give it back to me. So you spend your time passing problems back and forth while you remain frustrated and what? Unhappy. God faithfully cares for you through it all, but the rest in faith rests will not be yours unless you entrust your problems to him. Leave them with him. Move on with the assurance that your life is in his capable hands. So let me see. Okay, next page, page 11, characteristics of faith rest. 
Hebrews 4, 10 through 11. For the one who has entered into his rest has himself also rested from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent, eager, in other words, to enter that rest. We may not, lest anyone fall through following the same example of the disobedience. Hebrews 4, 10. First of all, faith rest is a continuous, habitual faith, which is often called perseverance. The word perseverance, so many people, perseverance, you have to have works. You have to show it by your works. But this one, it's habitual faith, perseverance in your faith in who? In God. So these are rich terms. So someone else might say you have to have perseverance in your works. Now where's the arrows pointing? It's in point, pointing at us, me. I have to persevere in my works. That's how a lot of people look at the word perseverance. But in fact, the perseverance is in the faith in Him. Patience in God. Patience does not imply that you just sit around and do nothing. Listen to this. Patience as described in Scripture means to be steadfast in believing God's Word. Focused on God's Word, knowing God's Word, to exercise a tenacious faith in that continues even when troubles persist so the faith is uh, tenacious in spite of the circumstances no matter how much it keeps ramping up and trying to push you back against the wall you're persistent your faith is in him not in yourself not in your works in him that's the difference so if your faith is in your works trying to prove that you're saved no wonder why you're miserable because what's going to happen is you're putting on a dog and pony show. You're showing people that you're a Christian. Oh, look at all my good works. Oh, wow, look at him. I knocked on all these doors. Your perseverance in your works is only making you tired. He doesn't want you to be tired. He wants you to cast your cares upon him. He never wants you to solve your own works or your problems by yourself. He wants you to give it to him. That's the beauty of having a Heavenly Father who is there to fight our battles. What in the world are you doing fighting your battles when you could be giving it to Him? Which is why you are not to be stressed out, be anxious for nothing. Why? God is, gonna, God is willing to fight your battles. But you won't know that until you study Bible doctrine. That's the problem, is that if you're not in tune with the key doctrines that are thought, taught throughout Scripture, you're not going to get to this point because you would have to read the Bible and then be able to discern in certain component, discern certain areas of the Bible that this is faith related, this is dependent upon Him, dependent upon you, dependent on Him, going back and forth wondering, kind of like what we did with Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ. So someone's going to misunderstand and say, I can do anything through Christ. I can hop like a grasshopper. That doesn't mean that at all, as we saw earlier. So he goes on and said, patience as described in scripture means to be steadfast in believing what? God's word. Not in your efforts, not in your confidence in yourself or your education or your efforts or your skills, but in God's word to exercise a tenacious faith that continues even when trouble persists. To cling to God's promises even though you have hit a dead end. Second, Faith rests is the absence of, uh-oh, what have I been talking about so far? All this works, perseverance of works. What does he say here? Faith rest is the absence of works. Has nothing to do with what you're doing. Absence of works. This does not mean that you quit your job and become a bum. It means that you let God do your fighting for you. You cease trying to solve your own problems. Apart from God's resources, you have a relaxed mental attitude, a peace of mind in the middle of everything that is happening around you. So as your circumstances are swirling around and your world is falling apart, you are still stable because God is fighting your battles. You're not worried about it because you've cast your cares upon Him and you're telling God and reminding God, you know, this is your battle. You said that I can trust you. You're believing in His words, His promises. And so you have a peace in the middle of everything that is happening around you. So now, last thing we'll look at, bottom of page 11. When every detail regarding creation was provided, the Creator rested. Not because He was tired, 
but because his work was completed, Genesis 2.2. Thus, as a memorial to his grace provision, God declared a rest, originating from the foundation of the world, Hebrews 4.3. This rest is perpetuated forever, top of 12. God has already worked out all your problems and now offers a solution for every dilemma. How many dilemmas do you have? How many problems do you have? Did you know he has already worked those out in eternity past? That's his sovereign plan for you and for me. But those resources are attached to the living word of God that has to be drawn out and extrapolated through Bible doctrine. So you need someone who is very fluid with the doctrines that have been put together by scholars in the past, such as R.B. Theme and a host of others and professors of seminary, so that when the pastor who is familiar with these doctrines and the Word of God and can engage and interact with the original text of Scripture and the Word of God in its proper context, he can then give you what God's Word says. Not what he thinks it says, but what he knows it says. And then you can check it out yourself and see if what he's teaching you lines up with what the Word of God says. And though you may not have the same expertise or knowledge as the pastor, you might be able to compare scripture with what he's saying. So if there's an obvious blur there, don't follow him at all. If I'm teaching something that is completely off, I don't want you to follow me at all. But there, that means you would have to know what the Bible says yourself, which is a good thing. But I do all the grunt work for you all so that you don't have to do it. You just have to be there with open ears, a willing heart, and a willingness to take in notes, record this however you want, and learn it so that you can use it in your life wherever you are so that you can advance the cause of Christ. So let me just read this last thing here. We'll go to the middle and then we'll open it up for some questions. So he goes on to say, the one who provided these promises is immutable. He doesn't change and he's true. Therefore, he's always faithful to keep his word. Lamentations 3, 21 to 24. And because he is also omnipotent, it's a 50 cent word that means he's all powerful, he's also, he is also to perform everything he has promised. Romans 4, 21. The mechanics will vary. He will either deliver you out of the problem or sustain you through the problem that you may be able to endure it. Did you, under, did you catch that? You won't get this in your typical Bible study because they will not typically link the two together. But please notice this. He, he is omnipotent and because he is, he's also able to perform everything he has promised. The mechanics will vary. He will either deliver you out of the problem. So do you have a problem? So watch this. He'll either deliver you out of the problem or you'll still go through the problem but he will sustain you through the problem. So what I've heard in some Bible studies, you just sit around and talk about, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? Oh, I think God will cause all things to work together for good. Well then, Bob over here is going through the same problem from two weeks ago, and we're still talking about, oh, he's going to work out your problem. He'll deliver you out of your problem. You don't have enough faith. That's why you still have the problem. That's not the reason why you still have the problem. It's possible that one, he doesn't know how to faith rest, and two, that God is actually sustaining him through the problem. Not that he's going to remove the problem. Did he remove the, the problem for Jesus? He let Jesus go through the problem. There's always a purpose for why God allows things to happen. But that won't be known unless you extrapolate these truths properly. And I stress the word properly because I get tired of people who are quoting the Bible when in fact and they're claiming to be Bible teachers when in fact it's a shameful thing when they are all divided amongst themselves and it's and it's bringing harm to to the name of Christ so I'm trying not to be so maybe mean but at the same time I realize that we're talking about my Lord here your Lord and if people are not handling the Lord's word properly, I'm going to call it out as it is. And then I've actually had, well, I don't want to uh, take any more time here. So let's just open it up for questions. Let me just uh, turn.
turn this off here or get out of this section here. And let me see if anybody has any questions. Just unmute your mic and let's talk for a little bit. We have, uh, well, no more time. But let's see. <clears throat> anybody have any thoughts or comments? Just unmute your mic and let's, let's see what we've got. Anybody? No? Did I scare you guys or did I just answer all the questions? Actually, I had a, something fast pretty. Okay. Uh, I, uh, ironically, I have another group of guys that, that, that uh, meet together mm -hmm. at noon time on a Zoom mm -hmm. pretty much every day. Yeah. And they were, um, it, it, it kept, it almost was redundant that mm -hmm. they were saying, you know, um, those that don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ is, is, is a fool and not saved. Mm -hmm. But to, to, to keep on that knowing that by being in the word, mm -hmm. they, they were saying that that's how you establish a relationship. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm trying to figure out if the key word in in I can do all things through Christ uh, besides Christ is mm -hmm. do mm -hmm. uh, because you, you have to you have to do right you, you can't just uh, just take in the word say yeah. okay I got it and meditate on it even yeah you have to do and, and I think that's the key correct me if I'm wrong but it, that's the key to understanding that verse I, I can do mm -hmm. and because uh, the futility that that happens in in my life mm -hmm. sometimes that saps up the hope takes away that doing yeah right and and so uh, could you ex, ex, explain more about that sure well contextually I was trying to show that the doing there is the doing of being content. Paul was content because he learned how to trust God amidst all the things that he was going through, including being in jail. So when your Bible study that meets at noon talks about having a relationship with Christ, those who... Uh, follow me on Sundays, you know that I've been talking about the, the importance of phase two salvation in the sense that salvation is huge and there's a phase one, phase two, and phase three. And I'm not going to go into all the details now, but I will just say this, that there is a difference between a relationship and fellowship. The relationship takes place only once you can't improve your relationship with God because once you are born again you are immediately born anew you are now a new creation in Christ and so Sam is now a son of God correct so if you be, you believe in Christ you are now born again so so that relationship can't be altered at all however the fellowship can be. The fellowship is going to grow as a byproduct of renewing your mind in the Word. So that ambassadorship, that discipleship, that following me is all built on discipleship. So that can improve. But the relationship can never improve because once a child, always a child. Because Christ is in you now, and you can't, you can't get any closer to Christ than Him being in you. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, Paul says. So I would say, I would disagree with your Bible study in that sense that you can't improve your relationship because the relationship once established as a son or a daughter of God can never be altered. Can you... What's that? So your fellowship can improve and it could be stronger 
as you renew your mind, as you, as you get into the Word. And I think that's what your Bible study it might be uh, merging and confusing because I started this study earlier this year and I, I quoted a, a, a professor who said the problem with Christianity today is that they're blurring Christianity and discipleship and that's what I've been studying and teaching for the past year that discipleship and Christianity needs to be distinguished because it gets confusing so I tell people now that they I can't I don't tell people they can improve their relationship with God because you really can't because once you're born again it doesn't get any better than that it's like my son he will always be my son that relationship cannot change but the fellowship can. So our time together can improve. It just depends if he's obedient. So if he, if, he, if he complies with daddy and mommy, our fellowship can improve. But can my relationship with him improve? No, because he's always going to be my son. I think we get caught up with, oh, he's my son, so I can let's improve the, the bonding. And I understand that, but in the spiritual realm, there is a slight distinction that needs to be established so that people are working on the right thing. Because we have a spiritual life that can only be improved upon the intake of God's Word, which that's what your, your Bible study is talking about. But I, I wouldn't say your relationship could be improved. It would be your fellowship that could be improved. So I, I take a different... Um, angle. Well, the, the other part of it is they're they're also judging. They're yeah, that's right. Instead of of walking through with yeah. bringing that yeah person to light yeah with with, with the word the gospel. What we right? yeah what we would do. That's why I've tried to. I know you're in Santa Barbara now, but if you're closer, I would definitely encourage you to go to Church of Hope in Elisa Viejo because. We would have uh, several people rally around you and show you that you are special in the eyes of God. And although you might have challenges, we all have challenges. You're not a loser. We're all losers in the eyes of God. But because we've been born again and have been extended grace, we're all winners. We all have the capacity to run hard for Christ. We have the capacity to look at life from his perspective and in spite of our challenges our, in spite of our shortcomings God accepts us the way that we are and he improves our lives as we renovate our minds in his word coupled with God the Holy Spirit so you would be you would be uh, encouraged a lot Sam and recognize that you're not you're not alone we're all in this together and so Church of Hope champions the the inculcation of sound Bible doctrine because a lot of churches don't. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing this long enough to know that, um, I, in fact, I was talking to someone recently that a lot of people don't know. I sat in Saddleback, uh, and I don't put say this negatively, but I sat in Saddleback to learn how he taught and what he taught based on what I was learning in seminary so that I could see for myself if what was being said about this church was in in fact true and so I was able to see what I was learning in seminary literally as I sat in his church as I was taking a sabbatical and going to seminary so I, again I'm not saying this in a negative way I'm just saying that I did for uh, at one point in my life and it was it was a learning experience so but yeah Sam you uh, the study there they should not be judgmental I mean, if they are, that's I wouldn't. That's not a healthy environment. I would definitely be surrounded like with a group like this. Everybody here recognizes the importance of sound doctrine, and has to be taught properly. And nobody judges here. They should not be. So, you know, yeah, I, I just wanted yeah. to show what Irene it is when, uh, right, when they they feel that I guess. That, that right self righteousness and yeah, and, that's uh, not good. And, and and instead of saying you know the fool does that you know yeah, you, you should be thinking about what what you need to do to step forward. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Like put it with uh, like the the prison guard, right? Like that. Yeah, 
They should be coming alongside and say, hey, I'm here for you, brother, that kind of thing. They should be supporting you and finding ways that they can help. And yeah. instead of just finding differences between Joe yeah. and him. Yeah. Because it's from what? Right. Okay. Very good, Sam. So when you're nearby, you should definitely go to our church in California. Okay. Yeah, definitely do you good. So thank you for sharing that because that's the reality of what's going on in different churches, different Bible studies. So thank you, Sam. Anybody else have any thoughts or comments? We are 11 minutes over. Not too bad, but I didn't want to forego anybody if they have any last minute thoughts or comments or questions even. Because if not, I'll close in prayer. But if you do, just unmute your mic and then we'll tackle it. All right, well, if not, then let me close in prayer and thank you all for your time and just uh, being available to learn sound Bible doctrine. I have been, oh, I do want to say one thing before I uh, close out. Um, uh, last week I had mentioned that I was going to try to um, combine the Tuesday and Wednesday studies and help out here on one, uh, Wednesday at the church here but I've decided not to do that so I'm going to keep the studies separate still so nothing's going to change it's going to remain status quo so we'll continue to do what we're doing so Wednesday nights will be the same at 7 p.m. Tuesday nights will be the same, 7 p.m. as well. So, if you're free on Tuesday... What's that? That was my wife. I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. So, um, just so you know, um, if you are available on Tuesday nights at 7, uh, Wednesday nights at 7, Pacific Standard Time, we'll continue as we have been. I gave it a lot of thought, and I don't think I want to... Uh, do the Wednesday night here I'd rather we've got a strong showing on Tuesday and Wednesdays and I'd rather sustain that and maybe down the road I, I'll be open to it but right now I, I'm seeing that there's a sense that I want to keep this going because I, I have a strong group on both nights and I don't want to disrupt that so so nothing will change so let's close in a word of prayer and thank you again for your time Father, thank you as always for giving us this opportunity to examine your word and to be reminded, like Paul, that uh, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And it's not that we can hop around like the bionic man, but that we can be content because of who we are in Christ. We know that we can be content because of our attachment with you, as we saw with the Apostle Paul. And not only with the Apostle Paul, our study. Christian at ease. We have no reason to be worried. We have no reason to panic. I know that's normal and natural based on our human nature and the sin nature that's resident in each and every one of us. But we also understand, Father, that um, we are not alone. We have you who can help us. And that's the reason why the Bible is replete with promises. So, Father, I pray uh, that you would uh, place a wall of fire around each person here, keeping them safe and keeping them, hung, keeping them hungry for your word. And so, Father, I'm grateful for everyone's commitment to sound Bible doctrine and your word. And I just pray, Lord, that as we continue with these studies, that they would be renovated and transformed like the likeness of your son, Jesus Christ, so that in the end they can bring you honor and glory because you alone deserve it. We thank you for this time, and we ask all of this through Christ's matchless name in which we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Bye, Winston. Bye. Bye, everyone. Good night. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor. 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 Thank you, Pastor.